Okay, I think we can start. Welcome everybody to the 2021 edition of Iberodocs or Iberodocs, depending on where you are. My name is Tatiana Heise. I am a long-term collaborator of the festival and a lecturer at the University of Glasgow, where I specialize in Latin American culture and film. This year, Iberodox is trying to be as inclusive and accessible as possible. So I will describe myself. I am from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I have shoulder length curly hair. I am wearing a white shirt and behind me is a blue wall and a settee. I am sharing the screen with our interpreter, Lou, who has brown hair and is wearing a black jumper. And I am absolutely delighted to welcome Martin Weber, director of Map of Latin American Dreams, Mapa de Sonho Latinoamericanos. Martin, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, um, I'm the director. Uh, I have a curly hair, I'm wearing a dark shirt. Uh, and um, well, I'm just here just to talk about the film. So I welcome your questions and the people questions from the audience, no? Yes, thank you everybody who is here watching this and those who will be watching this later. Um, so please write your questions using the Q&A icon. And um, if you haven't seen the film yet, it is available until Thursday at 6 p.m. And remember, there's also a photographic exhibition, which is online free access. So um, to start, Martin, I, I was telling you just before that uh, I found your film absolutely mesmerizing. At times difficult to watch, but stunningly beautiful. So for everyone watching this conversation uh, who might not have seen it yet, could you just give us the background to the project, how it came into being? You spent over a decade traveling across Latin America. Tell us about that. Uh, this is a film based on some photographs we made several years ago. I mean, the project starts in the early 90s uh, with um, basically me working from the visual arts specifically in, in photography, but also because I was studying uh, theory and I was reading Brecht and I was reading a lot of things that were somehow making me think about how images are presented, presented to us in everyday life. Um, and I was seeing how captions came to be ma mainly newspapers and magazines and how those words written underneath the image will direct your gaze or the way how to read an image. And I was, um, I just wanted to challenge that. I wanted to challenge the whole practice of documentary photography. Um, so I wanted to show how images are created. And if that's so, I wanted to do it in collaboration with the people involved. Um, so that's how I came to think of many things I had to do with the practice. Uh, among them, uh, I went back on how I learned to name the world outside in school with chalk on a blackboard. And I said, why not try to include something that in is invisible, which is you know, something that has to do with some something that the person being portrayed will share that if not, you no, know, will remain a secret. And for that, I came to the idea of asking people to share a dream or a wish. Also, in, in order to have people kind of look back into the life, come share it in the present, but also project us into the future. That was mainly how the, I mean, there's more thoughts to that, but I mean, I wanted to change how photographs were made back then, and I wanted to do this collaboration. That was a project that took me 20 years to complete. And I started in one country and through grants, little by little, I kept on adding one more and one more. Finally, I made eight countries that somehow, I mean, made, uh, they were relevant to many topics across Latin America. They were not, not all, but they were almost half of the countries that, uh, that, um, that needed to be photograph or included. Um, and I was more interested in the actions on the meeting with the people. So we created this kind of performance in front of the camera 
So there was, it was so much import, there was so much importance of how, what was made in, or what was happening in front of the camera as a way of capturing that action, no? And that created this kind of time capsules um, that, you know, 20 years later, one day I said, well, what happened with those dreams uh, and the people involved? What happened to our countries in that time? Uh, for the, the first one, I had read, contacted uh, news uh, people from journalists, NGOs, people that had worked in the ground before I arrived, because I will have a limited time to, to produce that portrait of each country. So I read a lot, I investigate, I, I, I kept in touch with these people. And years later, I went back to the same practice. Uh, I, I started to reaching out to the people that had helped me in the first place, trying to reconnect with the, with the original uh, uh, persons that had participated in the project. Uh, that was uh, something that I, I thought it was gonna be easy and, and short and it took me another 10 years to complete. Wonderful, yes. Uh, there's so many things that you said I'd like to pick up on. I mean, the, the whole idea of a time capsule, I think is fascinating. Reminds me a little bit about the work of uh, Eduardo Coutinho, the Brazilian documentary. But anyway, um, what I wanted to ask you, well, first a commentary. You mentioned the, the time capsule, you mentioned Becht and the captions. So this film, it takes us across a journey, across space, many national and cultural boundaries, but also across time. As you mentioned, there is this continuous movement back and forth from the past to the present. And in this journey across time and across geographical spaces, one thing remains constant, which is in Latin America, dreams and politics are inseparable. The dream of living, leaving poverty, the desire for a fairer, more equal society. And these are manifested in the micro stories we see in the film about the Cuban revolution, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, the Zapatistas in Mexico, the armed struggle in Brazil, Argentina, etc. Moving into the present, the film highlights how the political and socioeconomic structures determines not only our capacity to achieve the dreams, but what dreams we are capable of imagining in the first place. And there is a suggestion there that um, as neoliberal capitalism advances, the horizon of dreams is closing. So my question um, is about, you know, going back to Brecht and the captions and photography. I would like you to tell us about the blackboard as a photographic and cinematic device and how the meaning of this device changed over time for you and in the film. Well, you have to think of that when I started this project, it was really the early 90s. I mean, it was 1990 when I started with the idea. It took me two years to come with the final device and, and form that, uh, that the photographs will take. I mean, I actually changed cameras uh, just to slow down this, the process. Also not to be hiding behind the camera, but looking at people in the eye. So I went back to this kind of old cameras in which you have, you know, have to use a cloth, put a, the, you know, it's a four by five, you put it, you know, you put the film and people cannot move. There's something about um, the trust that needs to be uh, created. And it's very, very much um, a key point and I think a foundation for the whole project in itself. I mean, there's so much that has to do with people entrusting me their personal stories um, and sharing them through me with an audience. Uh, and the idea of the blackboard had to do with, as I said, this, uh, I looked at, at Brecht and how he was using signs within the staging of some plays in order to have two things. One, the, the idea that you will identify with the character, but those props will make you think or look on the context of that character. I had to think of, you know, okay, I go in, I identify, but then I take distance and I I'm invited to think of the context that has, for example, in my case, the possibilities of, of being able to complete or achieve their dreams or not. 
is is that gap that I'm I'm uh, continually invited to revise and to revise not only by the person who is doing it, but the audience and ourselves thinking, why is it so, some of these dreams seem so impossible when they should be something very easy to achieve. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. I mean, I can go on, but I know we have a little time. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I just thought it was a wonderful device and how in the original photographs, the I know, I know, I know. One, one thing is, you know, uh, empowerment. One of the things that for me in the early 90s, nobody was talking, almost nobody was talking about empowerment through, you know, photography, through uh, a, a practice. And I thought it was very important, you know, to have their voice included. As I said before, captions were things that being added, you know, at a, at a um, you know, um, in a newspaper and in a magazine, you know, by the journalists after. No, I just wanted those, you know, th that they should be their words and hopefully their handwriting. Uh, the only handwriting that does not appear is when people cannot write or they're handicapped. Those were, the, you know, in which I ask other people to do that for them. Uh, but I thought that was, you know, so important to, to start, you know, having that present. In a, in a material way, even, you know, with the chalk and the blackboard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Brilliant. Okay. We are getting uh, quite a few questions from the audience here. So I will start with a question by Marcus. Do you know if the characters portrayed in the film have seen it? Have they seen the film? I'm, I'm every time that it's being shown, I'm, I'm sending them links. You know, I'm having people, you know, e either getting passes or, yeah, that's something that I, that I try all the time that, that people will get a chance. I hopefully uh, wait for the film to be screened in each country. So they have this, I mean, they can share it at the same time that other people are doing it. If I don't get to do that, I will send the link to them in a way or another. I, I have a question about the screening later, but first uh, another question from the audience, Elisa Pulido. Which story touched you the most? Hmm, that's a difficult one. <laughs> Well, that's that's uh, the same with you know I was asked at the beginning with it what photograph or what story you, you know it's like asking you know if you have many children which one is your favorite <laughs> I don't think it's possible each one has something I mean um, they all take you I mean and there are so many stories that were not included that they were incredible but we couldn't fit them all um, so. They all have something and they all have this capacity of inviting us uh, to be in their shoes. One, one thing that I think the other day I was told by someone in the audience is, I, I, was, I was told how, I mean, she was thinking how, how it is that they can actually distance themselves and, tell, and they are able to tell their story with such a bearable, you know, um, richness, I mean, that's something that I think uh, is one of the achievements that you know you hope for, but you never know it's going to happen. And I, I think I, I, I'm I'm overflown. I'm, I mean, it surpassed any expectations that I had. But it might has to do with something that is very um, goes to the core of the whole project. That I mean, I was surprised that. 99% of the people said yes when I asked them, you know, can you can you write down a wish or a dream and I will approach them in the streets. I will knock at doors and houses. And um, and that got me thinking, and that has to do, I think, which how often are we really ask for that, you know, that we share what we want, that we, you know, express that. It's very seldom they're really, you know, and somebody really wants to listen to that and not, you know, make it into a product or a political campaign or something to profit from. True, to truly listen. Um, I think there's a, there's a strong relation there with the next question, which is about your use of camera and how, you know, it's a question by Robin. You mentioned that changing the camera throughout the project, and do you think that by using the camera you missed out on, on some moments? And if so, what? And I would just add to that, you know, how did your, the, the camera affect your relationship with the people? Um, 
First, as I said before, I don't believe in, you know, like the fly on the wall. I mean, that's something that I, I, I wanted to write off, just wanted to, to create a way of showing that, you know, as I said before, images are constructions. And for that, you know, I work with a camera and the photography part, which, you know, I have to put on a tripod, but also because I was interested in on this happening, this uh, performance, this I had to do more of a, a play or a little film in which, you know, the script was, you know, this minor words that were written on a blackboard. And that gave me the line to, to that scene. But also because there was something about picking up and working from the background up to, to, to include within the, the frame elements that would have information that were relevant to, to tell you the story about what is the context of that person? What is the context of that dream? What is the difference and the distance between that situation and the imagined one? Uh, now going to the film, I didn't do mostly, I mean, I did some of the camera, but very little. I decided that it was more important to have uh, DPs with, which were different, director of photography, I worked with several ones, um, which were incredible, and each one brought, you know, incredible talent to the film, and also a gaze. But I decided that it was more important for me to focus on the sound and the words. Mm -hmm. So I entrusted the image to other people, but uh, coming from, you know, from from image making in various forms, I knew how to 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 let know what I was looking for. Uh, there was a great communication and trust there. We set up and I, I overview, but also there was so much input coming from them. And again, this project is all about collaboration. But for me, it was very important to focus on the words, keep the, the team small for budget, but also for inter intimacy. There was, uh, I think there were stories that came out in a way that are incredible because we were very few, you know, we were three people, you know, a production person, the DP and myself. Uh, sometimes one more person because was helping just to help, you know, find things and, 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 and relate to people or translate um, in, in case of like Quechua, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, uh, those decisions are crucial on how, what, what is the result of what you see. And, and also, I mean, I believe that form and content go together. They, they both adapt or, um, or uh, impact each other, no? And you have to make the right decisions because that balance needs to be, you know, in the way that you want it to lead. <laughs> Wonderful. I could go on talking to you for a, an hour or more. We unfortunately only have time for, I think, one more question. It's a big question and we only have three minutes. So here you go. <laughs> Good luck with this one, Martin. Uh, do you think there is hope for most of the people portrayed in your film? Can you imagine how this map of dreams could be in 10 years, within 10 years? Well, I mean, yes. One of the things that I uh, we have to learn from all the situation and I think I, I pay homage and I hope we all do, is the resilience of people. You see situations that in the everyday are incredibly harsh and yet you see people standing up and going after and, you know, uh, and, and keep trying. You know, there's this woman in Guatemala chopping wood and doing all the things actually to help other people uh, have the time because she's taking care of the kids. So they have time and ways of finding jobs and be able to maintain a family or, or not, or travel elsewhere, which is not, you know, something she, she was really keen of because she actually almost lost two children to that. Uh, but then you have the Zapatista movement, which is very impressive the way, I mean, the art that they do and that farewell speech for me is one of, the most inspiring uh, speeches that I ever heard. And I hope uh, brings light to, you know, a new way, a new road to follow. Because I think we, 
as I said, we need to reinvent even language to, to not keeping repeating the same situation. If you, it's like Einstein's, if you keep re repeating the same, you're always gonna get the same results if you keep repeating the same formulas. Wonderful, thank you. By the way, that question was, was from Xavier Vilaris. Thank, uh, thank you, Martin, so much for this wonderful discussion. Thank everyone who participated and asked questions. And I, uh, again, encourage you to watch the film if you haven't already done so, and leave your opinion. Tell us what you thought, how you experienced this film. Uh, well, good evening to all and enjoy the film. And thanks again, Martin and Iberodol. Thank, thank you, Lou. Bye-bye, good evening. <laughs> ciao, ciao.